All right. Um, we are in, uh, we're studying uh, how to be better fishers of men. And last, we're looking at three methods on how to catch fish as Christians. Every Christian should be making some attempt at, to do the best they can to bring others to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And one of the ways we saw last week was outdoor uh, combined effort to pull the net. You often see Jesus, who did he call? He called fishermen. And they were mending their nets. A big part of the work of the Lord is keeping your nets mended. Keeping yourself right. Keeping yourself clean for that opportunity. If you have a net with holes in it, uh, fish are going to go right through. And so your life is a vessel. Your life is a an instrument in the hands of the Lord. So we as Christians should be mended. We ought to mend our hearts and ask the Lord to fix any holes in our life, holes in our net. So we as a, a combined effort, uh, that's what a net is. It's a, it's a lot of uh, strings roped together, amen? And that's what we are. We're a, we should work as a net for the Lord. The church is a, a safety net and it's a way to catch people. And when we go out uh, street preaching or door knocking as a church function, uh, you ought to pray and say, can I do something like that? I know Rachel goes out with Amanda. They door knock. They go out and visit the families of the children that they bring in. Last year, uh, Brother Bob went out with uh, me and Andrew, and Brother Matt Zamaki. I think, Drew, you went. No, I don't know if you made it. Oh, who was going? With? Oh, Brother Adam. Uh, Stiesel was going with us. So we had some men that said, hey, I want to go out there and, and just cast the net. Amen. And so uh, we've seen a few souls get saved out on the streets. Uh, you're not going to see very many in these last days, but the, but the Lord Jesus Christ was out in the open air. And even if uh, they receive it or don't receive it, you're preaching the word of God that men might hear and proclaim the good news. Amen. And our job is to do that, to preach the gospel to every creature. The majority of churches are, uh, are doing it in their churches. There's no public ministry anymore. And that's a shame. The, the church used to have a great effect on the public. The church used to go out and reach the lost. And they had programs, even things like YMCA. They said, let's open up an a organization where we can bring young men and women in, and they can work out, and they can... Uh, and they'll hear the gospel. We had soup kitchens all across this country. There's not as many. Uh, missions. Missions were big. People on the streets would get the gospel preached to them. That's public ministry, going out and reaching the lost. And uh, now the second way is, is more like a rod and reel, just one fish at a time. And that's what we're going to look at next. Uh, the second method is individual soul winning, witnessing the people that God brings into your life or you uh, cross paths with. And uh, look, uh, look at the verses here. And the, Jesus dealt with people that way. Look at Matthew 12. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this meeting. And we pray, God, you'd bless this Sunday school hour. Help all of us who have come here look, to get something from thy word, a verse of scripture that will speak to our heart about the need to be able to to reach the lost better help us to be uh, better instruments in your hand whether we go out like a as the uh, the apostles went out like fishermen with a net casting it in and catching 153 fish at one time uh, lord peter caught 3,000 in one day uh, souls we pray that lord uh, you would use us in any capacity whether it be uh, just a rod and a reel and just or just a, a cast net whatever me method we can use Give us wisdom on how to catch fish, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus said, I'll be, make you fishers of men. That's what we're talking about. Look in Matthew 12. If Jesus wanted us to follow him, he was a good fisherman. Uh, he did a good job. He's our example. Matthew chapter 12. And a lot of times the Lord dealt one-on-one -on -one with somebody. You'll see that all through the Gospels. Matthew chapter 12. And look at verse 11. And he said unto them, What man sh uh, shall there be among you that shall have one sheep? And if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? There's a picture of salvation. It's just one. You see the word one sheep. Uh, the Lord's focusing on, you uh, need to pray for one sheep. 
it, that might be your own child in your own home. Amen. God may give you uh, the opportunity to lead your children to the Lord. That's a blessing. That is a great blessing. I was able to lead Colin to the Lord uh, while we would have, uh, every night we'd read uh, the children's Bible. And he was about, he was nine years old. And we got to the Passover. And I went through there and I explained how that's the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of the heart. And I said, the death angel is going to come someday and destroy anyone that doesn't have the blood of Christ. And he goes, oh, I don't want to be destroyed. I said, we don't have to be. You're a sinner? He goes, yeah, I know I'm a sinner. And I said, well, you need to take the blood of the lamb. And he said, I want to do that. I want Jesus. And he got on his knees and he got saved in our apartment in Brooklyn, New York, nine years old. Um, a little while later, about two years later, we were traveling and uh, we were down in Dillon, Montana. And I was getting Dina a birthday gift. It was in July. And... Aiden was pulling on my sleeve, and I said, leave me alone. I'm busy. He's like, Papa. I said, leave me alone. And he kept tugging at my arm. I was like, what is wrong with this kid? And I looked over, and he was crying. He never cries. And uh, he's tough. You know, I'm thinking, oh, man. What did... I said, what did Colin do? And he said, uh, nothing. I don't want to go to hell. <laughs> I said, what? I don't want to go to hell. I said, why do you think you're going to hell? Because I was reading the, this booklet with Colin in, my, in the room, and it shows him going to hell, and I don't want to go there. I said, all right, let's go. And I went into the room 101 in Comfort Inn in Dillon, Montana, and showed him, went through the gospel track. It was, this was your life. You know, I, I said, look at these verses here on the back. I said, do you know you're a sinner? you know what sin is? And went through the Romans Road. And he said, yes. And I said, do you, you want Jesus to save you from hell? He said, yes. So we got on our knees, and he got saved. <laughs> There's opportunities, amen. You'll be surprised. <laughs> Some people don't even lead their own kids to the Lord. I mean, that's a shame. There's fish right there, your own kids. You ought to lead your kids to the Lord. They're one soul. They're precious. Doesn't matter if they're a child. That child, 8, 9 years old, 10 years old, 12 years old, has a soul. That soul's as eternal as a, an 80-year-old man's soul. It doesn't matter whose soul it is. We're dealing with souls. We're in the soul-winning business. And uh, this is, that's why even children don't overlook opportunity. I've led more children than I have to the Lord than I have adults over the years. Why? They have a tender heart, and they see things plainly. They see heaven and hell, the devil and God. They don't, you don't have to uh, send them. They went, they had to go, these people had to go to college to be talked out of sensibilities. You know, you go to college, and then you don't believe there's a God, and you don't believe there's a heaven and hell. You, philosoph you become a philosopher. But children are easy. You open the Bible with a child and you show them what God says, you're going to lead a lot of children to the Lord. Amen. If you can get a niche and find out where neighborhoods kids are playing, I'll just go down to the neighborhoods. We'd take the bus out in Lighthouse Baptist Church, and we'd go to the neighborhood where we wanted to bring kids, and we'd just find kids on the street and witness to them. And uh, led a lot of kids to the Lord that way. We, when we had tent meetings in Ukraine, we led a lot more kids. A lot of the kids would come and get saved. So don't, don't look at it at an age or who's important. The soul's important. That's what you've got to remember. That the soul of everyone is eternal. And if you can take a 10-year-old and show them Christ and get them saved, there's a better chance they're going to live for God then that person who's already 60 years old is going to live for God. I'm just telling you the fact. When you get someone saved young, that is a, bears a big impress on their heart, and the Lord can move in their heart. So don't underestimate the value of one little lamb, one little child, and find opportunities, and you'll be surprised. The kids are willing to listen. And so look in, uh, Matthew, uh, look in Matthew 12, verse 22. We're in the same chapter. Then was brought unto him one. So here the Lord said over here in verse 11, one. Uh, there's a connection. One sheep. What is he in a miserable way? He's fallen into a, uh, you know, into a pit of despair. You know, that sheep couldn't get out. Uh, there was an old movie with uh, Tony Curtis and uh, what was that black actor? Uh, Portier. Portier. Sidney Portier, they, 
They jumped into a big mud hole. They were running for someone seeing them. They got they were chained together. Anybody remember that? But it was they were like, now we're in here. How are we gonna get out? <laughs> And uh, eventually they got out. 48, he stood on his shoulders and was able to just reach some kind of a metal thing and pull their body out. But there's some pits that are too deep to pull out. And the Lord, the Lord says, this man here is one soul. And the Lord cared for this man. Most people would see somebody wretched on the streets. Uh, whew, that guy smells like fecal matter. He's urinated on himself. Oh, man, he's just filled the devil. Well, there's the picture the Lord just said. A man, if, if, he, if, if a man has a sheep, one sheep, and it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day. And here's a man just a little while later, verse 23, then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil. I mean, that maniac of Gadara, he had devils, and most people wouldn't bother to deal with people on the streets that are filthy or dirty or vile or uh, troubled, prostitution or... Uh, that's who the Lord went after, amen? He went and led that one soul. You just never know what God can do, amen? amen. Don't, uh, it's a soul. We've got to remember, we're in the soul winning business. The, judge not according to the outward appearance. So whether it's a child or whether it's somebody demon-possessed, you ought to have compassion on them and say, that's one person I can reach. I mean, there was a guy named Danny, and he was with a woman, a Mexican girl named Maria, they were the most wretched looking people, but I told them I'll put you up in a hotel. They were, uh, they were strung out on drugs. They were all wet, walking in the streets, and they're asking me for money. I put them up in a hotel and said, why don't you come to my church tomorrow? I'll pick you up. And I did, and they came to church. They got saved. Amen. They were, they, they, he went on to be a, a preacher. <laughs> I went and visited a friend of his in a, in a crack house in a real pigsty named Dan, uh, Danny, no, uh, Johnny. And he was on he was on heroin, and he got so he came to church. He got saved. <laughs> I mean, you just never know, you know. And they went on to live for God. I, I was down in Pensacola about six seven years ago, and up comes this guy, and he's he got a beard, and he's like, "Hey, how you doing, brother?" I said, "How you doing, brother? You don't remember me, do you?" I said, "No." He goes, "I'm Johnny. Remember me back in San Diego?" Johnny, wow. He goes, yeah, I was pastor in the church. I got three kids. I got a wife. Uh, he married some girl who's a, this guy, uh, Gerard. He's a missionary in Papua New Guinea. He married his sister. And he's, he's been preaching the gospel all those years. I didn't keep in touch with him. It was a blessing. Amen. It was, that's one of the biggest blessings. To see somebody who was a demon possessed or drug addict or drunkard, what God can do. Amen. God can transform that soul. Don't underestimate what God can do. When we go out soul winning, don't say all that, oh, I better stay away from that person, or God can't. That, that. No, man, God can save anybody. That's the first thing. we got to realize if we're going to win souls, we, we have to believe that God is able to save the soul to the uttermost. That the most wicked and vile sinner like that maniac, if Jesus could touch him then, he can touch him today. Amen. One soul is precious to God. That's what it says here. Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and, and he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? I mean, that's what's amazing when God will take a sinner and transform that life. Amen? It's an amazing thing. Why? It ought to be amazing to you because God saved you. <laughs> you know your sins. You know what God did for you. It's amazing. And the people were amazed. And that's what we're trying to do. We're in an amazing business of seeing one sinner get converted. And so uh, we're, where am I at on my notes here? We're talking about the one-on-one. -on -one. Here's another one, Matthew 19. Turn a couple chapters to the right. We're talking about the one soul at a time method. One person. That's really the only way you can win souls. You have to take, even, you know, even though 3,000 got saved on day of Pentecost and later on 5,000 souls got saved, that's a rare thing. That's a blessing. Amen. Sometimes you have a big revival meetings and Billy Graham would preach and you'd see hundreds of people go forward and, and many of them did get saved because I've had many a brother say, I, where'd you get saved? I got saved at a Billy Graham crusade and they're sound minded Bible believers. Amen. A lot of people got saved there. They, they surrendered to God and they heard the, heard the gospel. Back when Billy Graham, he preached the gospel. 
Amen. And so there were many saved that way. Billy Sunday saw thousands get saved. But the general work of the Lord is going to be a quiet, you find your little pond somewhere and you got your, you got your little uh, rod and you're casting it out. And you cast it out. I mean, how many times I've gone fishing and I've thrown that thing out there a hundred times and didn't catch a thing. Amen. I mean, that's a lot of times that's how fishing goes. <laughs> you try this spinner, you try that, and just nothing. And that's, it could be discouraging. You don't even want to go fishing next time. Like, ah, no. Nah. But it's nice when you catch fish, right? And that keeps you thirsty for the next time. Uh, you might catch fish, you might not. Trying to win a one-on-one -on -one is not easy. Going out and meeting with people and talking to people. Uh, but it is precious. It's an amazing thing. Matthew 19, 16. Again, it says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And the Lord began to witness to him. One person came to him. You're going to have opportunities in life where people are going to come to you and they're going to ask you some questions. And you ought to be ready with have an answer. The Bible says that you ought to have an answer for everyone that asketh you. And you ought to be able to lead someone to Christ. Look in Luke chapter 15. We're talking about one soul. Luke chapter 15. And uh, verse 5. It's the same as that if a man have a sheep to fall in a pit. But here it says, what man of you, verse 4. What man of you having a hundred sheep and lose one of them? Doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness? That's how precious it is, that one. It's all or nothing. <laughs> it seems to me an odd passage. I, I, it's not a reasonable premise. I always felt jeopardizing ninety and nine for one. That's how precious one is. Because the Lord says those ninety and nine represent the self-righteous anyway. Didn't have no need of the Savior. And he says... Uh, and uh, lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner. I don't know about down here. But you can say somebody got saved or, oh, Amen. You know, but over in heaven, there's rejoicing <laughs> over one sinner. That's how precious it is. Uh, there's joy. And not only that, but look, read on it, that they repenteth more than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. So, uh, where does it say in, uh, in the, verse 6, 10? Okay, likewise I say unto you that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God. What is that? Who's in the presence of the angels of God? God. He's in the midst. There's God's rejoicing over one sinner, even more than the angels. God is so happy and thrilled that a soul got saved because he'd sent his son to die for that soul. That's how precious. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. If you could just get one sinner in your lifetime, that would be a lot because God rejoices over that. One sinner over one soul. Uh, he likens it to a, a woman here in verse 8. Either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece. Now the, the thing is that that one realizes it's lost. There's a, there's a comparison here. The other ones were never lost. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So the comparison, he says in another place, uh, about 90 and 9 just persons that have no need of repentance. Over, and one who needs repentance. Uh, he says, they that are uh, whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So here the, the, the picture is that the 90 and 9 are not lost. They don't think they are. They are. It's the one that realizes they're lost and call upon the name of the Lord. That's the rejoicing. And the Lord says, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one, this is another thing that's lost, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it, one, one coin. Now the pictures here is, uh, it's very valuable, precious, uh, the soul of one. And the Lord uh, always seemed to deal with one person. 
Nicodemus came to him by night and he dealt with him. On one chapter, chapter 3, you have a very righteous, self-righteous Pharisee. Kept the law, for the, tried to live by the law, tried to be holy. And the Lord dealt with his need. And he knew the scripture, I mean the Lord wants you to know the scriptures like him, that you can deal with that person's need. And uh, God will have to give you wisdom to do that. I mean, you have to study your Bible. You have to find out, how can I reach this person? This is a hard nut to crack. Some people are hard, most people are hard to crack. I mean, everybody seems to have enough layers to keep them insulated from getting saved. Everybody. The devil's done his work. Just dealing with people. Uh, they've got so many uh, excuses and reasons. What about the, you know, the African? What about the aborigine? What about, you know, men wrote the Bible and uh, you know, I, I pray every night. I've man, you could go on and on. If you try to win souls, you got so many ways that people just do not see they're lost. And to get them to see they're lost is the is a hard task to show them. And that's why children are great because they believe the Bible. They'll hear the Bible and say, "This is God's word." The problem with men and women is they get older, they begin to listen to the humanists and the liberals. And the, and the modernists and all these people that have attacked the Bible. And so they start to have doubt as they get older. The older you get, the harder it is to get saved. Statistically, boy, if you hit 70 and you're not saved, man, it's like one in a million. Your chances of getting saved. It, it just gets harder and harder to lead that one soul to Christ. And uh, you got to find a way to get to them. And Jesus in the next chapter deals with the a woman who's a harlot, a, a woman of whoredoms. So here you have him dealing with a Pharisee in one chapter and then dealing with this prostitute, this whorish woman who's had five husbands and the one that she has is not her husband, sleeping around. And they both have the same need. They need a new heart. <laughs> they both need to be born again. There's no difference really in God's eyes. Man's eyes, wow, he's a religious man. And Jesus said the same thing with him. You must be born again. Your religion is not going to get you in. Your righteousness isn't enough. And so you've got to deal with one-on-one, -on -one, like Jesus. Look in uh, John chapter 4. Look in John 4. The Lord, our ma he's the master. He's the master soul winner. He spent time with people, opening them and uh, the scriptures. You've got to know the scriptures. We've gone through the Romans road. But you should add to that. You should add verses that will be in your Bible. Write down the verses. How to answer people's questions. Say, if somebody asks this question about, you know, this, put it down three or four verses. Have some reasons. Have some answers ready to go. Um, and so uh, here's the Lord. He's dealing with this woman's heart's need. And verse 11, the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou, thou that living water? He started talking to her about water. He found a common interest. What you want to do is you want to get a lure. Uh, when you're fishing with a single bait, you know, you got to find out what will lure them. Find out what they're interested in. Um, I've made some big, I remember some big mistakes on soul winning. I remember I went out with uh, Aaron Taylor one time. And we're talking to this man, and it seemed like things were going all right, and somehow the subject of guns came up. And he seemed like a good old boy. We were down in Mississippi, out on the front porch, and Aaron started talking about guns, and he's a pastor down there. And the Second Amendment, this guy was adamantly against guns. And the whole conversation, we were, we was getting, we were going down the Romans Road. And then he should have just said, the cardinal rule is if it's not dealing with their soul and them getting saved, just avoid it. Just say, you know, that's a good question, but can we get back to that after we're done? That's what you need to do. When somebody brings up, you know, some question about the Pope or about guns or something that doesn't have to do with them getting saved, you say, that's a good question. You know what? I'll answer that after we get done. Just, that's a cardinal role in soul winning. Don't answer that. Don't get off track. Don't let them, don't let the devil throw a boomerang to get them out of what you're dealing with right now, their soul, that important thing that you want to tell them. Amen? There's a devil, the, the, all, the, the people got all kinds of things in their head and they'd like to go all over the map. 
And what you got to do is just say, that's good. That's a good question. But you know what? Let's finish here with this. And then we, I'll talk to you about that afterwards. And it's okay. And then you just go on with what's really important. You know what? Nine times out of ten or even probably more than that. <laughs> probably like one, one time out of a hundred. They said, okay, what about that question? They forgot it. That wasn't even, that wasn't even their question. That was just the devil throwing something in their mind, and that's how people are. They just, oh, what about this? You know, and, and it, doesn't mean, it doesn't mean a hill of beans. It doesn't, even, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, their soul and what we're talking about. And so when you get down and they get saved, uh, they're not even caring about that anymore. They're happy they just got saved. Amen? So you've got to be wise with that. Just... You know, stick on the, the lure. Keep them on the thing that... So you might find somebody that... Uh, some mother at some PTA and you find something in common. You get to talking to them. Uh, you, and the subject comes up and how to raise children. And that, you try to, try to make a beeline to Calvary. You're at a gun show with some guys talking about guns. You know, you look for an opportunity to make a beeline to the gospel. Amen. You say, right, right here, the Lord, give me wisdom. This man's talking to me. You got to know me. There's people you meet all through the walk of life. You'd be surprised. That's how Jesus did his soul winning. He didn't say, okay, today is Tuesday, 3 o'clock, I do my soul winning. <laughs> that isn't how the Lord met this woman on the well. He sat down in a place where he wasn't supposed to, according to the Jews. The apostles were appalled. They said, Lord, if you knew. How many times they said, if he knew what kind of man or woman this was, he wouldn't have nothing to do with her. They came back and they were like, Lord, what are you doing talking to this woman? You know, and they were like, Lord, we've found some meat. Let's go eat now. And the Lord says, I have meat which you know not of. My meat is to do the will of, of him that sent me. And his meat was the desire of his heart. The thing that satisfied his, was winning that woman to Christ, to himself. And that woman got saved. He spent time talking about water. Then he turned this topic to her sins and how God would deal with her. Her religion wasn't good enough. He, he said, uh, you got to worship God in spirit and in truth. Your worship up on that mountain in Samaria, <laughs> salvation is of the Jews. Your religion ain't going to save you. And he dealt with her on her religion. He said that your self-righteousness is not going to get in. You're not righteous. You've committed sins, and you're not going to get in. You need the, the Messiah. You need to believe on the one who was sent. And she got saved. She went back and told her whole village. Said, come and meet a man that told me ever, everything I ever did. And he knows he's the, he is the one. He's the Messiah. And then they came and heard him. Uh, you'd be surprised. So sometimes you lead like Paul in uh, Acts chapter 16. Uh, the, the jailer got saved. God did a miracle. And there was that one jailer. He was listening to them sing, watching their testimony. There's people watching you. There's one person watching you at work, one person watching you in your neighborhood. They're watching you. They know you're a Christian. And so they're watching Paul and Silas and these two guys. They're having a time of their life. They're singing, you know, the B I B L E. They only got there in the stockade, right? <laughs> and there's midnight, and they're like, they're like uh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, and, and this guy's like, these guys are nuts, man. I'm miserable. I got me a good job and a wife and a family and a house. And, man, I ain't got nothing to sing about. <laughs> and these guys, they, they're in there. And we beat them already. And we put them in the stockade. And they're in there singing till midnight. You guys, go to bed already. Every night, man, it's the same thing. These guys are praise God in the highest. And you know, they're praying out loud and they're singing. Man, that guy just couldn't get over that. He's like, these guys, as soon as, man, if trouble comes, we'll see what they're really made of. They're pretty tough now, but, and then the doors were all open, and he thought, oh, they ran, I'm sure. And he sprung in and called for a light, and there they were, just hanging out. He's like, what in the world? Why didn't you guys run? He knew something happened. He said, these guys, these guys, they, and they wanted to see that man get saved. They were praying for him. They probably told me, hey, you know, Philip the jailer, we're praying for you. You know, and then this guy, he just said, man, what are you praying for me? You guys are the ones that need prayer. You know, people looking at you, they're wondering, how are you so happy? And what, you, you're miserable, man. You ought to be miserable. Why aren't, I got more than you got. I got all these things. And you'd be surprised, man, and, and what God will do when you just keep on singing God's praises. They're watching you. And so uh, 
that jailer got saved. And what happened next? It says, he asked, he said, uh, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He wasn't talking about his body anymore. He's talking about his soul. They, he knew they were talking about the soul. Because a lot of times you deal with somebody about being saved, they think, yeah, I was in Nam, man, and God saved me. And I was in this horrific car wreck one time, and God saved me out of that. You know, that's how they think. They don't understand my soul's going to hell, and God's got to save me out of that. They think God's always been good to me. He saved me out of so many things. Yeah, God saved me. I believe God saved me. You got to make sure they understand what you're talking about. And so this, this man, this Philippian knew for sure. Uh, believe, and he said, what must I do to be saved? Man, I'm, I'm, in God's eyes, I'm wretched. And you guys have been preaching righteousness and grace through Jesus Christ. I need that. And finally, the light dawned, and he sprung, for, called for a light. He got the light of the gospel. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And that's the thing. That woman went back in town and brought a bunch of people, and they said, Not because you told us, but now for, we heard him ourselves. We believe his saying. But he said, if, if you believe, it can transform your whole household. It can transform so many lives. And don't underestimate that. You see someone get saved, a child, the parents can come to church, and God will just transform the whole home. Daddy gets saved. There used to be a song, uh, Pray for My Daddy. He was a drunkard. He had a bar. Uh, it was an old tent revival song. Boy, that was a great one. Uh, I can't remember the words. Anybody know the words of that song? Pray for my daddy. He's a drunk in town. Uh, the Marshall family used to sing. Anybody ever heard of the John Marshall and his, his daughters, the Marshall family? Joel, you've heard of them, right? Oh, that was a real good song those girls sing about pray for my daddy. You pray for somebody. You keep praying for somebody. That little boy was praying for his daddy and came to the tent meeting. He said, pray for my daddy. The preacher went by. That drunkard got saved. It's real stuff. Amen. I knew a guy in Har Harris Har uh, what is it? Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And I met him at a revival meeting, and he got saved. And he, he took all his booze and poured it all out in a sink. I mean, he had thousands and thousands of dollars of bourbon and whiskey and, and scotch and, and uh, what did the Russians drink? Vodka. <laughs> and, he, and you know what he did with his state liquor license? You could sell that thing for $100,000 because they're limited amount. And you can't reprint them. You, it's given to one person. And you could give it to somebody. They, you could sell it to somebody, but it's like a possession. It's like this, what do you call that when you go and sit through that thing and, and you get a timeshare, you know? <laughs> so you can give it to your kids, that timeshare thing. But he took that liquor license and burned it up. He lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And he, and he got out of that stuff. But God could save anybody, Amen. That's what you got to believe. And uh, God saved that woman by the well. He saved that Nicodemus. It doesn't matter if they're a religious person or if they're a wretched person. He saves them. And here's this Philippian jailer. He thought he had it made. He had a good job and everything. And he realized he's wretched. And he heard them and they had the joy of the Lord. People need to see the joy of the Lord in your life. They need to see you have something that they want. You got, you got to have it though. Amen. You got to have something that they'll want. And that Philippian got, uh, Philippian jailer got saved, and then his whole house probably got saved. He said, if they'll believe it too, then they'll get saved. And then they did, because it says he went, let's go there, Acts chapter uh, 16. And look at verse, this is where he asked the question, 30. Acts 16, 30. And after they were singing all night, and the guy was ready to kill himself, he knew he was supposed to die because if his prisoners escaped, then he has to give his life. And so when he comes in, he was startled to find that they didn't flee. I mean, what jailbird's not going to run out, man? The gate's wide open. There's, no, there's been a shaking, a, a stirring, a shaking, and the place was shook, and they could all fled, but they didn't. And he brought them out, verse 30, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and all them that were in his house. He was the key, one person. Then the whole house gets to hear it. So when you're winning souls and you lead one to Christ, that thing there could, you don't, it's like, you, it's like tip of the iceberg. You never know. 
it's amazing what's underneath that water. With the, I've been watching uh, some of these glaciers when they start calving. You ever seen that? And th I've seen one that was the size of Manhattan. Some guy was recording it. I mean, the once it all started going, others started toppling. And this huge iceberg come f up out of the water, like and upended and looked like a whale. And, and you just like, if you could just see one soul get saved, you never know the domino effect. How many lives have changed in generations to come? Don't underestimate that. What one soul can mean, the Philippian jailer, his whole house got saved. It says, and, 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 and he took them that same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. So he got saved and all his got saved because they all got baptized right away, straightway. And uh, just no telling what God's going to do. Don't, uh, don't uh, think it's a small thing that one soul got saved here, one soul got saved there on a, in church or <laughs> wherever. You go out, you uh, work with people like your ministry, Amanda. You go knocking on doors with the, Rachel, say hi, we just wanted to know, and, you know, and just get to meet the parents. God will save through them kids. They hear stories from the kids. They see the results in the kids' life. Uh, keep it up. When we street preach, take somebody aside. Show them the Bible. Even though we're out throwing out the net, you still got to go one-on-one. -on -one. You still got to get caught. You can't be like, oh, I'm out here with everybody holding a sign. If somebody walks by, try to put a lure out there. Say, hi, how are you this evening? And get a conversation. See if you can stop them. Get them to stand still. That's the hard thing. The devil's got them beelining, you know, through life, playing music, keeping them busy. Like keep you so wrapped up with the world, you never have a chance to stand still and let somebody witness to you. He'll do that their whole life. Just to get them to stand and hear. That's what it says in John chapter 2. About, I mean, John chapter 3, I think the, 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 uh, the bridegroom standeth and heareth. You can't get them to hear if they don't stand still. People are so worked up. I mean, it's a frenzy, the world. Keep them so wrapped up. Do you hear what I'm saying? you got to get someone to stand still and sit down for coffee. Just whatever you can to stop them. <laughs> you get that fish to see the lure. Stop. <laughs> and swimming upstream. Just slow down. Hey, over here. We're trying to catch fish. And you got to get them to see the sparkling or get something to catch their attention. And you've got to have a life that will shine. Paul had that in that prison. That Philippian jailer got saved. He had a, a record, had a testimony with that man. And he got saved. And then his whole house got saved. Amen. Isn't that a blessing? I mean, there's a lot of you have had that experience. Somebody, Tristan, his grandfather, he was a Christian. And he witnessed and Tristan got saved. He went to church with him, right? And when he died, didn't you get saved? Wasn't that right when the day you got saved was like right after your grandfather died? Yes. His light bore great witness on your life. And that broke up your heart. You said, man, I want to be with my grandfather when I die. <laughs> Amen. So live in a such a way that it affects people. And uh, shine the light through you. Look in Luke chapter, uh, well, let's go to uh, John 8, 10. We're just looking at examples of people in the Bible. One person on, with one person, mainly, just dealing with a person. John chapter 8. And uh, here was a woman, one woman, taken in adultery. And she was condemned, and she was despised, and she was mocked. And um, there's a lot of people out there depressed today. A lot of people feel they want to kill themselves. They don't feel like, I want to live. Nobody cares about me. I'm, 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 a, I'm trash. I'm worthless. And the Lord asked her a question in verse 10. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are, thou, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? And she said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. He dealt with one woman again. And uh, there was no one there but just her and Jesus. And you're going to meet people and you just try to find out their situation and, and their need. And, and preach to them Jesus and show them Christ. And there's a good example. Here's another one. In Luke chapter 8. 
We go to another chapter 8, Luke chapter 8. Look at Luke 8 and verse 45. And the Bible says, and Jesus said, who touched me? And the Lord knew it. It's kind of like where he said, Adam, where art thou? <laughs> he puts put people on the spot. You know, that's what he did to the woman at the well. He said to her, thou hast well said, <laughs> thou hast had no husband. Thou hast no husband. You know, thou hast had five husbands, and the man that thou hast is not thy husband. He dealt with her sin. And this, this woman here, she come up and sneaks in, and she feels timid, and, but she wants to be healed. She tried everything. I don't know how many years it says, um, verse 44, uh, verse 43, and a woman, ha a woman, one woman, having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any. <laughs> she was in the crowd, and we go out there, there's a crowd of people, but there's just one person in that crowd the Lord saw, the Lord knew. There, and she had a need, and the woman having an issue of blood 12 years. Verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee. They want to criticize the Lord. <laughs> That's just funny. The people don't understand when the Lord says something. And they want to rebuke him and put him in his place. And throng thee and press thee and say, and sayest thou who touched me? Lord, are you, are you normal? Are you in your right mind? They don't know who they're dealing with. He's the God of heaven. He knows everybody in Kalispell. He knows what they need. <laughs> Jesus knew everybody in that crowd, and he knew everyone's heart. He knows where they're at, and he knew how to deal with her. He had compassion. And Jesus said, somebody. He made her a somebody. Because they said, nobody. She's nobody. There's nobody. You said somebody touched you, and don't you know there's a throng of people touching you right now? And she went from a nobody to a somebody. <laughs> That's what happened to you when you t Jesus touched you or you touched the hem of his garment. You were a nobody. And you became somebody. <laughs> and you had an issue and God dealt with your issue. And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me. For I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And you got virtue. And they, they need that virtue. They need, I don't know what that is. Virtue went out of me. That, that to me is like the wildest thing in the Bible. One of the, like, what does that mean? How can God lose something, you know? He's like, I sense I, some of it went out of me. He's, he's eternal. He has no end of virtue. But he says, virtue went out of me. That's pretty wild. And God has virtue for everybody. If they will just be touched. If they can just get to him. And that's our job is to say, you need to touch Jesus. You need to call upon the Lord. And he's not far from every one of us, the Bible says. The men should happily feel after him like a blind man trying to find Jesus. They are. They're out there. They don't know what they're looking for. They're looking for happiness in a bar or try to find a person to marry. They're trying to overcome some of the things that, that devastated them in their youth. And they're just trying to muddle through life. They're blind spiritually. Really, why are we here this morning? We're here to lead the blind to the Savior. We're here to bring... Uh, we're just beggars bringing other beggars. Remember those beggars that went out and found all the the riches of the, um, what was that, the uh, Midianites? And they were out there eating, and they were like, and there was a famine, and people were selling dove's dung, a calf of dung, dove's dung for whatever. Remember that story? And those lepers, that, what are we doing here? There's enough here for everybody. And they went back, and they got everybody who was dying and brought them, and God delivered Israel again. And that's all you are. You, somebody brought you one-on-one -on -one to Jesus. Somebody brought you to the Savior, and it's our obligation as lepers who have been filled and enjoyed to say, wow, I need to bring some other leper to Christ. I need to bring, remember the one verse says there was one bl blind man, Bartimaeus. Another place there were two crying out. I, don't, I, I could believe easily it was another whole other situation. But sometimes one man cries out, and another one says, hey, me too. <laughs> And you know, it's just, it's just like I said, it's like those glaciers pfft, knocking up. Man, the dominoes. Just think about that. You lead one soul to Christ. Somebody led Bob Miller to Christ. Man, how many souls Bob Miller's led to Christ over the years? 
because somebody took time to show Bob Miller the way of God's grace. And that just, amen. Somebody handed preacher here a gospel track. Paul Whipple. But he got witnessed to by several people. Out on a street, he gets a gospel track. Then he's in the in he's laid up in the in the infirmary and somebody witnessed to him there too, I think. And it was like God was going bang, bang, bang. You might think I'm the one trying to reach it. God might have had three other people go to that person before you got to them. You might just be a series of people saying, Hey, would you read that? Man, I just somebody was just telling me they were praying for my soul the other day. My mother's been saying I need to get saved. You just don't know what you, what that might do. And somebody witnessed, and somebody witnessed, and then he read that thing how many times? Three times? Four, five. <laughs> he got reading it over. Did I get this straight? He got saved. How many souls did Nathan Bemis lead to Christ over the years? So it's you say, well, we're living in the last days, and no, things haven't changed that much. It's been the same way since the days of Adam. Fornication, drunkenness, drugs, adultery, cheating, stealing. Man, hasn't changed. We, we need to be aware that we don't blame the world for their lost condition. <laughs> They've always been lost. Amen? We're just not very good at fishing. You say, well, they're, you know, man, the fishing today ain't what it used to, it used to be so much better. Man, there's still a lot of fish out there, out in that lake flat. There's still fish all in that lake, uh, that river. There's fish. You just got to go out and you have to work and catch them. But they're not going to jump in your boat. And so uh, here's, here's an example, a woman who had a need, and Jesus cared about her. The, whole, the rest of them couldn't see her through the crowd. And that takes perception. Um, it takes a burden. It takes care, to care about souls. It really does. It takes a, uh, something that God has to put in you to see people as souls. I mean, it's so easy to forget. You're going about life. You go to the bank. You go to the gas station, you, you uh, talk to the cashier, you, and you see bodies. You see people with brown eyes, brown hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, a woman, male, female, piercing. This one here has got a suit on. This one's, you know, you just see bodies. And it can get that way where all you do is the rest of your life, you go through life just seeing people as just bodies and see their body. But you gotta, you gotta pray, God, open my eyes to see the soul. And you gotta keep doing that because it's, you can get to where you forget. You're, there's a soul in that body. And you have to say, God, let me see them as souls. It's not, it's, it just doesn't like one time and then everything's like your eyes are open. You gotta pray that all the time. You gotta say, Lord, help me not to forget. Help me not to forget these are souls in need. And, uh, this woman had a need. And look in uh, Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. Here's a man that was like that. He was sensitive to the Holy Spirit. He had the burden for souls. His name was Philip. He was one of the deacons that were chosen, one of the evangelists, one of the seven, the Bible says. And he just had a sensitivity. If you're going to be a soul winner, you've got to be, I guess you've got to think like a fish. They, I, I mean, when I hunted back in Pennsylvania, they called me the deer whisperer because I would round up deer and chase them to the other hunters. <laughs> I had this, I had this knack, you know, where I would just chase the deer and ground them up and then do a drive, and I would use all kinds of methods, and I would, uh, you know, be doing grunt calls and bleeps and, you know, me and eh, eh. I can't do my throat's dry right now, but. And I'd run up a hill and I'd trick them and chase them and finally I'd corral them. One time I had about 20 deer and I ran them right down their valley and I said, I called them on the phone, which he's not supposed to do, and I said, Dina, get ready. They're coming right down your way. And Kevin and, and Eddie tell them all, let them know. And she's like, oh, it's too cold. We're in here having hot chocolate. And I was like, I worked for three hours to get them deer rounded up for you guys. But in a sense, you got to be a soul whisperer. You got to pray, God. You know, you heard of horse whispers, people that can sense the need of that horse or a dog whisperer. And, you know, you could fight the dog or you can learn how, what works with the dog? What's the dog want? 
You know, he wants that little snack in your pocket. You got to learn to show him this is not acceptable. And show, like there's something about people have a need in their soul. They don't even know what it is. But you have the answer. And you could be like, Lord, sh help me to be a soul whisperer. Help me to be able to bring that soul safely to haven to Jesus Christ. And it's like, no, learn how to train a horse. Um, I, horses don't like me because they can sense, uh, you know, I'm nervous because they've bitten me before. But I tell you, Jody, they love her, you know. She walks up to them, I'm sure they don't bother her at all, and they listen to her voice. But I used to have this big red horse, man. I raised 12 racehorses, and I'd be cleaning his hoofs out, and he'd reach back and bite me. And I'd go up and punch him in the head. We did not get along. <laughs> I was not a horse whisperer. <laughs> I had another one. He, he, I opened up the gate, and he ran, and I caught the rope, and I, and I went down my hands, and there was a knot at the end of the rope, but I was now behind the horse. And he looked back, and he, oh, they're smart. And he went, bam, and he threw me in the air. <laughs> he kicked me good. They, they're, they're, they're naughty. Horses can be naughty if you don't show them who's the boss. And uh, they'll get away with stuff. But you have to be a horse whisperer. You gotta be a soul whisperer. You gotta say, Lord, show me how to corral that spirit. Help me, help me to show that soul what they need. And this man was good at that. As we close here, look at this man's, we're talking about dealing one-on-one -on -one with people this morning, how you can be a better soul winner. Get them to stand, get them to find a lure. What are they interested in? Show them, think about how precious they are like Christ and make them a somebody. Show them how precious their soul is to God. In Acts chapter eight, and it says in verse 26, Here's a man, Philip. He's going about, and the Bible says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Nobody wanted to go to Gaza. That's down there. That's where the Philistines live. And he went against the grain. But you know why? He was sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit. It says, And the, and the angel of the Lord said, He spoke to him. The Lord spoke to him and said, Go down there. Nobody wants to go down there. Go where no one else is fishing. Listen to the Holy Spirit. There's so many opportunities you'd be surprised. And say, Lord, where would you have me to go? And he arose and went. He obeyed God. I mean, you got to go. If you're going to, the first two letters of the gospel are G-O, go. And he went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit, again, he listens, saith unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And that's boldness. And it comes to the Holy Spirit. You got to be bold to go ahead and approach people. This man wanted somebody. He said, how can I understand the Bible? <coughs> Verse, uh, he says, uh, understandest what thou readest? And um, in verse 30, and Philip ran thither and said, understandest what thou, what thou readest? And, you know, ask somebody a question. Get them talking. Get them talking. Say, uh, oh, you read the Bible. Good. You know, uh, so do I. And then you understand that? What are you reading? Okay, get him talking. And he said, how can I? Except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. He got closer. He opened up. There's a breaking down of that uh, barrier. A stranger ran up to me. And he just started a conversation. And he seemed to relax a bit. He said, come on up. Sit up here with me. Uh, can you show me what this means? And then he opens his heart more and more. So soul winning is like, like I said, it's like a soul whisper. <laughs> you got to know this person's not ready right now. They don't want to talk. Okay, then don't push it. Try to just plant some seed and leave them a go. So I've had plenty, but you just don't. They're not ready. This guy's ready. You got to be ready if they're ready. And say, Lord, the fish are biting. <laughs> Man, I got my pole, got my lure, I'm going. They're biting. There'll be times when they're biting and use the opportunity. Here they're biting. This man was ready. I mean, sometimes the fruit's right, it just falls off the tree. You just touch it, right? And it's ripe. So you pray for that. Lord, give me the opportunity, give me the sense, give me the discernment to see when the fruit is ripe.
And where's my heart? So that I might be ready to glean that. That I might be ready to catch that fish. Catch that soul. And so he did. And he gave him the simple gospel. He didn't force it. He explained Isaiah 53 to him. He explained the scriptures to him. You can explain the scriptures to people very simply. Go to Romans. Show them the grace of God. Show them that the Lamb of God was shed. His blood was shed for you. We're all like sheep have gone astray. And then bring him in. And that's what happened here. And the man said, I believe. And Philip opened his mouth, verse 35, and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. That's one-on-one -on -one preaching. And he, uh, and he got saved. He said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God with all my heart. And he went down and got baptized after he got believed. So let's, let's go ahead and uh, pray that Lord would give us spiritual discernment this week to be able to lead someone to Christ that may be their last chance too you just never know there have been opportunities God gave me and I passed and person died and uh, or some I've witnessed to and they say come back later and I found out they died and so uh, let's let's realize that souls are perishing amen let's pray father thank you for the continuing study of how to win souls to Christ Help us all, Lord, as Christians, Lord, to be desirous, Lord, to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when he says go where, and go where, to what direction. Here he said to Philip, go south to the way of Gaza, and he obeyed. And then he saw a eunuch sitting in a chariot, and he says, uh, go to him, and he ran. And the, and the eunuch talked with him, and he opened up to him. And Lord, we pray that you would show us uh, people along our path that we would be able to minister to like this evangelist Philip we pray that you'd open hearts this week and we pray that the Holy Spirit would make us sensitive and tender to the needs of those that are lost and we pray it in Jesus name amen